the Sermon on the Mount. And you find that sermon in Matthew chapter 5 through to the end of chapter 7. You can find this powerful sermon that Jesus preached to all of his disciples or his followers as they gathered on the side of a mountain to hear him teach them these amazing life principles to live by. Our text this morning is our Lord's teaching on the Beatitudes of Christ, this first part of his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, beginning here at verses 1 uh, through 10, 11. Picture Jesus there on the side of a mountain, and he's, that's his platform, and he's teaching his disciples. But as he taught more people come to hear him who had been following him, and we see that here in verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then others were gathering as well. In Bible times, it was normal for a teacher or a Jewish rabbi to sit while he taught, whether it was on a stool or on the side of the mountain or on a bench or wherever. It was very much... Uh, part of that culture for him to sit uh, and to teach his audience as they would gather around him. And it says here that he went up on a mountain. It is believed that this mountain was a high hill on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus often would go. So it would have served kind of as a natural kind of amphitheater, if you would. Kind of that kind of setting for him to teach these people who had gathered to hear him. Let me read for us these Beatitudes of Christ, or what I like to refer to them as beautiful attitudes that Christ had and that he wants every Christ follower to have as well. Here uh, in this passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, beginning here at verse Verse 1, and seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, you know, here are the, the eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, bless the word of God now to our hearts as we look at it this, this morning. And Lord, there will be a message for each one of us. And so, Lord, we as your people can experience what true happiness is all about, true joy is all about, as we live out uh, these beautiful attitudes that you want for us to have, that Christ himself modeled in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep in mind that these Beatitudes can be understood in at least three ways. First of all, they are, they are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. That's what they really are, these Beatitudes. Secondly, they contrast kingdom values. Jesus being king, Jesus ruling, he spoke often of the kingdom. Matthew is really all about the kingdom kingdom of God, where Christ is, is, is ruling and reigning on the throne of our hearts. So the contrast here, he contrasts kingdom values, that which is eternal, with worldly values, that which is temporary. And then thirdly, they contrast, the Beatitudes contrast the superficial faith of the Pharisees with the real faith Christ wants in his disciples' lives and in our lives as disciples today. Please understand, these Beatitudes are not multiple choice. You don't pick what you like and leave the rest. They're not a multiple choice thing. Instead, they must be taken as a whole. They describe what we should live like as Christ followers, to be happy or to be joy-filled in our lives. Even when circumstances do not go our way, we can still have joy as we live up to these standards that he gives to us here in these Beatitudes. Each Beatitude tells us how to be blessed. Who here wants to be blessed? Amen? How are we going to be blessed? Well, he tells us how here in this passage on his Sermon on the Mount. The adjective blessed 
used, is used nine times here. If you were to take a pen and circle the words, you'd find nine times it's used, and it comes from the Greek word, as I mentioned the other week, makarios, which means to be happy or to be or, or blissful. It's a supernatural joy that God gives to us. But blessed really means more than happiness. Because it's happiness depends, as you know, solely on your circumstances being favorable. When circumstances are not favorable, you're not happy, right? Sometimes we get a little ugly, right? But this, this blessedness is, is more than, than just happiness in your life. To Jesus, blessed means the experience of hope and joy independent of outward circumstances. So even when things aren't going well, you can still have joy. You can still have this supernatural happiness or joy, if you would. So to find hope and joy, the deepest form of happiness, choose to follow Jesus, no matter what the cost. Choose to follow Jesus and to live like Jesus lived. And as you use all of these Beatitudes as a whole, not just pick some here and there, but you use them as a whole, you will experience uh, this life that Jesus lived in a life full of joy, even when circumstances don't go well. So by choosing to live as Jesus lived, follow and then follow Jesus' formula for living, you too can experience true happiness, even in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. You can experience this happiness, this joy. So if you want to know how to be truly blessed, find true happiness, follow Jesus. And these conditions in his secret formula, if you would, for personal happiness found here in these Beatitudes. Last week we examined the first four. Happy are the humble, verse 3. And happy are the hurting, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, they should be comforted. And happy are the harnessed. Remember that one? We talked about meekness, right? Happy are, the, blessed are the, the, those who are meek. And then the last one we looked at last week is happy are the hungry. For those who hunger and thirst after God and after righteousness uh, shall be filled. Today we'd like to examine the last four of these beautiful attitudes that Christ exemplified and that you and I who are followers of his today should exemplify in our lives as well. Condition number five, happy are the helpers. Happy are the helpers. Notice verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The Greek word for merciful means to be actively compassionate, to show pity, to give help to the afflicted, to anyone in need. Merciful. It, it's a genuine compassion with a pure, unselfish motive to reach out to someone and help them. Mercy is all about helping the helpless. The cripple, the sick, the deformed, the poor, or the aged. Mercy is being is seeing a man with, without food and giving him food. Mercy is seeing someone lonely and giving him or her company, a widow, a single adult, a shut-in, a hospital patient, a fatherless child. The Bible says in Psalm 82, 3, that uh, to defend the poor and the fatherless, to do justice to the afflicted and needy. Mercy is meeting that need. Not just seeing the need, but meeting the need. It's like the Good Samaritan, you know, those three religious guys came by and passed by. They saw him laying there half dead, but they didn't go and help him. But one man did, the Samaritan man did. He showed mercy to that man who was beaten and left half dead on the side of the road. Mercy is what many healthcare workers globally are doing in hospitals and nursing homes and helping COVID-19 patients. Mercy is helping feed the hungry in a soup kitchen. I was talking to Brother Patrick a little earlier on, and I don't know if you know, but uh, he goes in every Tuesday uh, to the soup kitchen here in Fredericton and, and, and volunteers four hours of his time to help in the soup kitchen there. And that's great, Patrick. Praise God. That's showing mercy. It's not only knowing that people are hungry, but helping feed them. You see, that's mercy, isn't it? Mercy is providing clothing for the needy through close to you, Paul and Lynn, and uh, Margo, and others, Ray, and others. It, it, it's, it's feeding those who, who or it's, it's providing clothing for those who are needy, of clothing, demonstrating uh, your love and your, your mercy by your actions and your concern for others in need. Jesus, of course, is the greatest example of mercy, is he not? There, there's uh, his experience with a woman taken in adultery. He didn't 
condone what she did, her sin. He hated her sin, but he loved her and he forgave her, the sinner. He didn't condemn her like everyone else was doing and trying to do. In fact, he said, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Do you see his forgiving spirit to her? Do you see how he was merciful when others were merciless and wanted to stone her? He showed mercy. Go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 53 for a moment. In this classic Old Testament chapter on the sufferings of Christ. And listen to what the prophet Isaiah prophesied concerning Jesus' sufferings. And, and we know that this prophecy was fulfilled some 700 years later at Jesus' own trial and his gruesome crucifixion on Golgotha's hill. Here's, here's what it says here in verse 7. He was oppressed, speaking of Jesus, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before shears, he is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He could have opened his mouth, right? He could have opened his mouth and called ten thousands of legions of angels to come and take him down and get him off that cross or wipe everybody out that was there. And he could have done that, but he didn't. He showed mercy. He showed mercy. That's, that's, that's being merciful, what he did. Now, sure, Jesus didn't sweep sin under the rug. He confronted sin. He turned the tables of the money changers in the temple court, for example. But, dear friends, he never rendered evil for evil. He never rendered injury for injury. Even as he hung upon that cross, what did he say? Do you remember what he said? Those uh, famous last words of our, Christ, of our Lord Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, that's the epitome of mercy. Amen? And I'm glad he showed mercy to you and to me in laying down his life upon that cross. Think even now of someone in your sphere of influence that could use a little mercy. Could use a little mercy. Can you think of someone this morning? And the result or the blessing of being merciful is that you too will obtain mercy when you need it. And in turn, find happiness in being merciful to others in need. Condition number six, happy are the holy. Notice verse eight of our text here on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says here in verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Reminds me of a little boy who had just listened to a long sermon. Uh, it's tough being a kid, isn't it? Listen to long women preachers. And this little boy was walking out of the church on this particular Sunday after church, and uh, he kind of had a big frown on his face, and he had uh, been qu quite fidgety in the service, and his father kind of nudged him and, and reminded him, whispered to him about being still. And anyways, on the way out the, the door, uh, out of the church, one of the deacons asked the little, little Johnny, he said, what's, what's the matter, Johnny? You, you look, you look, you look a little sad this morning. Well, the frustrated young boy responded quickly, I am. It's hard to be happy and holy at the same time. <laughs> well, maybe you too uh, feel that way at times. It's, hap it's hard to be happy and holy at the same time and uh, sit still in church, isn't it? Well, the word is translated pure here is the word used in several ways in the original Greek language. For one thing, it was often used to mean something that was pure or unmixed with anything foreign, such as pure gold, which has not been mixed with any other metal, or milk, which has not been watered down or diluted. Or again, it often simply meant clean, this word pure, like a dish which has been thoroughly washed, or clothes that have been just washed. Now apply those meanings to pure in heart. Pure in heart. If we are truly pure in our hearts, we will have a single-minded devotion to the will of God. Our motives will be unmixed. Our thoughts will not be made impure with those things which are not right or are displeasing to God in my life. And our hearts will be clean because we will not tolerate known sin in our hearts and allow it to pollute us. 
We will take seriously the Bible promise in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, which says that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us all sin, our sins, to cleanse us of all sins, and, and He will do that. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus Himself was perfectly holy, perfectly pure and holy, or without any sin. Any taint of sin at all. The Bible says he did no sin. 1 Peter 1.19 declares, But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. In other words, Jesus was without sin. He was perfect in holiness. And he was undefiled. Not tainted with sin at all. And he was 100% pure within. And as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He knew no sin. Yet he became sin for us. For us to be more pure and not deluded or polluted by the world, that is, a society without God, as, as He is pure, we must be disciplined in our lives in avoiding ungodly influences on social media or on the television or the internet or the movie industry or who we connect with or the wrong places that we ought not to be going. And we ought to be very careful what we read what we listen to. And ought, we ought to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can keep ourselves unspotted or undefiled by the ungodly world around us. So that we can have that purity within our souls so that we can in turn be happy. The Christians who are not living in purity in their hearts and are just doing whatever they want to do and, and not dealing with sin and not avoiding these, these kinds of things, they're not going to be happy. They're going to be miserable in their heart because of their disobedience and their sin and their impurity within. So you see, for, for the, the, the kingdom of heaven dwellers, you and I are to have a passion for holiness. Amen? We are to have a purity within our hearts that drives us and motivates us to be more like Jesus, to be holy as I am holy, God says. And you will be blessed when that is your passion and your heart's desire. Condition number seven, happy are the healers. Happy are the healers or the peacemakers. Notice verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Let me share with you four realities that we need to grab a hold of if we are going to be peacemakers in the truest sense of the word. First, the meaning of peace. The word peace comes from the Hebrew word shalom. Let's say that together. Shalom. Beautiful Hebrew word, is it not? Shalom. And when a Jew says to another Jew, shalom, he doesn't mean may you have no war. He means may you have all the righteousness and the goodness that God can give to you. Folks, that's peace. That's what shalom means. It means to have the righteousness of God, to have real calm within that comes from a right relationship with God. That's peace. It comes from God. Second is the maker of peace. And who alone is the maker of peace? Class? God Almighty. God Almighty is the maker of peace. That's why I need to know Him, right? So all experience is peace. The Apostle Paul penned these words, For God is not the author of confusion, but of what? Of peace. He's the author of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, God is the author or the maker or the source of peace. Not our political leaders. Not the United Nations. Not Mohammed. Not the Pope. Not Franklin Graham or any other religious leaders. But God is the author of peace. And apart from Him, there is no peace in the truest sense of the word. Only Jesus Christ can heal our sin, sick heart of people and bring peace. Only Jesus can. In fact, six times in the New Testament alone, Jesus is called the God of peace. The God of peace. Even one of the great Old Testament names given to God reminds us that He's the God of peace. He's the maker of peace. That Hebrew name is Jehovah Shalom. Say it with me. Jehovah Shalom. That's what the greeting people would, would greet. You know, God is peace. Jehovah Shalom. Meaning the Lord Jehovah is peace. Jehovah is a Hebrew word for God. 
Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace, Judges 6.24 says. So I asked you this morning, is he your peace, my friend? You see, apart from Jehovah Shalom, you cannot have peace with God because your sin separates you from a holy God. The Bible says in Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked, or those who are in their sin. Peace in your heart, peace in your home, peace in your marriage can only come from peace with God in your life. And without this peace with God in your heart, you cannot be a peacemaker in the truest sense of the word without knowing the peace giver the Lord Jesus himself. So this leads us to our third reality, the messenger of peace. And we discover who the messenger of peace is in 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians rather, in your Bibles, and you can turn there if you would. 2 Corinthians, in the New Testament, chapter 5, and note if you would, verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us a ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now stay with me on that. That's a big word, isn't it? Reconciliation. It's the word peacemaking. So if you mark in your Bibles, just right beside the word reconciliation, peacemaking. Because that's what it means. It's peacemaking, the word reconciliation. So it could read this, that God has given us the ministry of peacemaking. That's the ministry he's given to you and to me as followers of Christ. So, so you and I as Christians, as those who are born again into God's kingdom and have peace with God, are to be messengers of peace. And carry out the business of peacemaking. Today it's called evangelism. Or soul winning. It's telling the gospel of peace. Romans 10. No wonder it says in Romans 10 and 15. How beautiful are the feet of them. That preach the gospel of peace. So evangelism. Being a fisher of men. In essence is peacemaking. Dear Christian. Do you really want to be a peacemaker? then be sure to tell somebody about Jesus this week. Fourthly, fourth reality is the making of peace. Let me share with you quickly four areas where we can be a peacemaker. Area number one, we can be a peacemaker in our homes. We can be a peacemaker in the home. One preacher told the story of how a gentleman came to him with a serious domestic problem. He and his wife quarreled violently over trifles, and each kind of blamed the other, and the domestic stress had built up to the breaking point. The preacher then asked the question to this troubled couple, he said, do you and your wife, or to the gentleman, he said, do you and your wife go to church, and do you have family prayer? And the man answered that they did neither. And the preacher then gave his heart-searching response to this man. He said, Sir, your trouble in the home is a reflection of your lack of peace with God. Get right with God, and you'll be right with your wife. Wow. Isn't that what the message should be? The Bible reminds couples to never go to sleep if you've offended the other, or if you are angry one with the other. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it warns, Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Talking to couples. To anyone, for that matter. In other words, don't go to sleep without working out your differences. And saying, I am sorry. Will you forgive me for what I said or did? Peacemaking in our marriages. So, you can go to sleep in peace. And I find until I do that, that I tell my wife I'm sorry for something I said or did, I have a hard time going to sleep anyways. And we discovered that. So I'm to get it over at the start, right? Rather than lay there and, you know, not sleep and toss and turn about it because I've got I've, I've done this to my wife and I've hurt her or offended her. I need to say, hey, honey, I'm sorry. I really messed up. Will you forgive me? And then I'll get a good night's sleep. Huh? Doesn't that work? It really works. We have couples out there today. So area number two, we can be a peacemaker in the community. Not only in our homes, but in our community. What, what's happening is 
many in our communities and our cities are controlled by what Galatians 5 calls the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. And then Paul lists them. You can read them there in Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Uh, around verse 20, 21. He lists the works of the flesh there as hatred. Is there any of that going on in the world today? Hatred. Variants, he lists. Variants are fits of rage and violence. Any of that going on in the world today? How about wrath? Outbursts of anger. Boy, read, read the headlines of the newspaper, right? Fits right in for the day. The works of the flesh. And strife. Strife is arguings. And seditions, that's divisions, and racism, it's right there. And envies, where does it all come from? It comes from the works of the flesh, this old sinful nature that I was born with. So in, instead of, of the works of the flesh in our communities and in our cities, we need, there needs to be Christians like you and I who are controlled by the works of the Spirit. The works of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Listed right after there, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love and joy and what? Peace. Peace. Peace in our communities. It comes from peace in our hearts. And patience and gentleness and kindness and, and, and meekness and faith and self-control. Area number three, we can be a peacemaker in the church. We can be a peacemaker in the church. Believe it or not, strife and discord and division can happen in the church. In fact, Paul mentions two women in the Bible. I'm not picking on women here this morning by any means. Thank God for women in our church. But he, he, he refers to these two women in the church of Philippi as he's writing. And uh, their, their names were Iodias and Syntyche. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, he employs Iodia and, and Syntyche to work out their differences and to be of the same mind. To be at peace with each other. And that's why Paul exhorted the Ephesian believers in Ephesians 4 2 to bear with one another in love. See, if I'm bearing with one another in love, I'm going to work out my difference with you because I love you and I want peace with you. And then he says they're endeavoring to keep the, the, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God wants peace in the church. And then area number four, we are to be peacemakers at work. And we see this in Titus chapter 2, verse 29, reading from the New American Standard Bible. Urge bond slaves, that's employees, to be subject to their own masters or their employer in everything. Notice what he says, to be well-pleasing. And then notice this, not argumentative. In other words, but peaceful. In your workplace. Refrain from argumentative. Tendencies. So, at work, I am to work hard to maintain a good testimony. As Christians, we should be the hardest working people on the job center, right? And, 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 and honest people. Check in a certain time, you know, keep to our own certain time where our breaks and we finish on time. We're hard working people, we're honest working people, and we do everything to please our boss. And to respond to situations in a peaceful manner, not an argumentative manner. Because we bear the name of Christ to our boss and to the others that we're working alongside. So be a peacemaker. Condition number eight, happy are the harassed. Happy are the harassed. Verse 10 here. I'm not going to mention much about this point because of time here this morning. But happy are the harassed. Blessed, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's no doubt that the Bible teaches that every believer who is faithful to Christ must be prepared to be persecuted or rejected at the hands of those who are the enemies of the gospel. Indeed, all who desire to live godly of God's life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 now, most of us won't face imprisonment or torture or death because of our persecution, but, you know, uh, the, a godly person, one who serves Christ and exhibits purity and integrity, uh, is not always welcomed and admired by those who uh, live differently. Uh, 
For example, they may even react and refuse to include a Christian in their social gatherings because his very presence is a rebuke to them. Uh, an employee may find his advancement blocked because a supervisor is prejudiced against Christians. A teenage girl may find herself laughed at because she refuses to join in immorality of her classmates, etc. There you have it, the attitudes of Christ, or the beautiful attitudes that every Christian follower, every Christ follower, is to exemplify in their lives, including you and including me, just as Jesus did in his life. Here in these eight beatitudes, you have God's standard of living, and they are for right here, and they are for right now. They're not for, you know, the millennial kingdom or whatever, but they're for right here now. As pastor and Bible teacher John MacArthur said, they are the best means of evangelism I know. If we ever really live out the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes will knock the world over for Christ. End of quote. So, child of the King, let's go knock the world over for Christ. And through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, living out these eight Beatitudes, where we are, where we live, where we work, and rub shoulders with people, we can make a difference. That's a challenge, isn't it? For us as followers, King Jesus. And as we do, we will discover a happiness, a peace, a joy that only following Jesus and his kingdom living can give us. A former unbeliever who had, at the time, recently discovered the peace of God said to Billy Graham one day, my wife and I used to wake up in the, in the morning quarreling. And we used to go to bed at night bickering. But since we have found peace with God, our home is heaven on earth. You too, here this morning, or listening in this morning online, can experience this peace with God in your hearts. You ask how? Well, by first acknowledging your sin and opening up your heart to the King Jesus. And by believing in Him, receiving Him into your life, and believing in His death on the cross for your sins, and that He rose again from, from the grave to give you new life and eternal life. And then by confessing with your mouth, your faith in Jesus Christ to save you and come into your life. And only as you do can you be forgiven by God and have peace with God. Will you do that today? If you have not made that decision before, we encourage you to do that. And before I close, I would like to mention if you are watching online or listening in, that we would love to put into your hand a little Gospel of John and uh, send that to you. If you can give us an email. We'll send that to you along with a little leaflet entitled, Do You Have a Relationship with God? We'd love to put that into your hands as well. And then another little one, Steps to Peace with God. We'd love to help you further to make sure, indeed, that you do have peace with God. Father, we thank you for this morning hour. We thank you for this time together. And Lord, to those who are here this morning, listening in, and to those who are watching online, we pray your blessing upon each one, that each one would seek God and seek a relationship with God and have this peace with God in their lives and in turn take that message of peace in the gospel and spread it to others by how they live and how they talk and by open doors to speak a word of the Savior to somebody. We pray. And Lord, help us as your people to live out these beautiful eight attitudes in our day-by-day -day living, right where we are, right on Main Street, right where the rubber meets the road. Lord, as we rub shoulders with people, live out these eight beatitudes. And in them, and only then, will we be truly joyful in life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand.